So good morning. Uh, welcome to the Federal Procurement Fraud Overview and Practical Insights webinar. My name is James Forrest. I'm the Program Coordinator for the Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as NorCal PTAC for short. And we're very happy to have uh, Manat with us. They are partnering with us for this event. And we're going to have uh, Serena Castillo, Richard Hatunian, and Andrew Zimidi for their team who are gonna be offering the main presentation as well as answering your questions at the end. Thanks also to Olivia Dolmage, who will be helping out on their end from behind the scenes. So before we hand things over to them, um, which I'm very excited to see their presentation on this, it's a new topic for me. I just wanna give you a little bit of a spiel on PTAC and what we offer. So we are a small nonprofit program. We're, help, help, uh, we're set up to help small businesses achieve success in the government marketplace. Most of our funding comes from the DLA, that's the Defense Logistics Agency, but we also get uh, funding from the state, California state, as well as some local funds. All of this funding means that we provide all of our services to the public at no cost. So it won't cost you anything to join our webinars and it won't cost you anything to become a client. We're hosted by the Humboldt State Sponsored Programs Foundation. That's up in Arcata, California, where that red star is, that's where I'm sitting. And last year, NorCal PTAC uh, through this organization, through our funding, helped our clients win more than $268 million. And the data looks like we're, we're set to far exceed that number this year as well. So you've come to the right place. Each PTAC does this uh, with three basic core services. The first, the bread and butter of what we do is one-on-one -on -one procurement specialist counseling. So our procurement specialists can meet with you individually and help you with just about any government contracting topic you could think of. So if your business is located in one of our counties here that we've highlighted in green, we can meet with you via phone, video conference, email, whatever works for you, and we can work through all of these processes that are required to sell your goods and services to the government. There are quite a few. Second thing we do, we offer these virtual workshops, mostly these days. Um, in non-pandemic times, we do have in-person outreach events and workshops. And these are all on government contracting topics that we craft that we think are going to be useful for you. Um, and so sometimes, for instance, we partner with uh, other organizations like Manat to bring expertise outside of our own organization. These are open to anyone to join from anywhere, so you don't have to be in our service area. You don't have to be a client. Um, many of you are probably new to PTAC. Check out norcalptac.org slash calendar for more upcoming events. And I think I'll go over a couple of them a little bit later. Third thing we can do, which is pretty neat, is we can set our clients up with a bid matching service. Uh, it's a paid service we subscribe to, but we offer it for free. And it gives you daily access to federal, state, local, and even prime contractor opportunities. So if you have this tool, it, stay, uh, it keeps you updated when there is an opportunity posted that matches your desired criteria. So that's pretty neat as well. So uh, the, the, the overall message is if, if your business is in one of these 15 counties, we do go by geography. So your business has to be headquartered in one of these counties then you're eligible to apply for our services for NorCal PTAC. Like I said, all counseling can be provided remotely so you don't need to leave your office. In order to get started to apply, visit norcalptech.org. Hit that red apply now button on the top of the page banner and fill out the steps one through seven. If you've worked with the SBDC, that's a small business development center in this region or anywhere nearby, you should instead just email me at info at norcalptech.org. That's on the banner, it'll stay there. And I will send you some special instructions to apply. We share a database with them, that's why. Um, and I said PTACs in general, and that's because we are just one PTAC of um, a whole network of PTACs across the country. They're independently run, uh, but they share the same funder. There are 94 of them. Uh, last time I checked, well, it's always changing a little bit. So if you're not in one of our counties here, these 15 counties, um, don't worry. If you're interested in PTAC services, we encourage you to look up and apply for your local PTAC. And we've put a link there on the slide, aptac-us. Um, .org, find a PTAC. I just Google find a PTAC. <clears throat> it's usually the first thing that comes up. So uh, there are a couple of other them in California and they're all over the place. They're on the East Coast, they're everywhere. So uh, don't despair if you're not in our service area. Um, so we hope to see you in our client database soon. Um, and let's, uh, before we hand things over, I just wanna do a little bit of uh, housekeeping here. So uh, you're all muted for today's webinar. 
Um, that is by default, but we will have a um, Q&A at the end. And so what I'd like you to do um, is to enter any questions that you have during the presentation. So um, if, they're, if they're saying something you don't quite understand or you just have something that on the tip of your tongue you need to get out, just go ahead and type it in the Q&A feature uh, and we will read your question aloud uh, it, once we get to the Q&A, which is at the end of the presentation. Do note that there is a chat and then there is a Q&A. To keep things simple and streamlined, we want everyone to use the Q&A for questions they want read aloud. The chat will be if you want to say thanks, if you have a technical issue, um, something like that. And I just do want to remind folks, since we always get questions about this, uh, we are sharing the slides with everybody. We're, I'm, I'm going to email those to everyone this afternoon. And we're also video recording this session. So the video will be posted to YouTube, linked to our website, and sent to you uh, directly via email. So don't worry, you'll get all the links, you'll get all the slides, and you'll get the entire Q&A and everything. So I think we're just about ready. Uh, I will hand things over, I believe, to, for, to Rick to start things out from the Manat team. And thanks once again for partnering with us. We're really excited about this. Thank you, James. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm um, Got control of the uh, comm here and uh, welcome. Good morning. Uh, uh, some of us are on the East Coast, so we're uh, starting our afternoon here, but it's great to be with you. We want to thank uh, James and his colleagues at the NorCal PTAC for inviting us to have a discussion with you this afternoon about federal procurement fraud. Uh, an overview uh, and some observations that myself and my colleagues have made in the course of our work and some insights into what you as federal contractors should be concerned about and mindful of so that you can avoid uh, the challenges that come along with a, an investigation into your procurement practices. Uh, you have, as you have heard, a great resource available to you with the uh, NorCal PTAC and uh, we have worked with other PTACs around the country and seeing the value that they bring to companies who have to navigate the maze of complexity that's associated with the federal procurement process. And so we, uh, we urge you to work closely with them. And when there's a problem or an issue that arises and that happens, and we're gonna talk about how those problems develop, what they look like. Um, we are in an age of, of heightened scrutiny uh, into government contracting and into the ways uh, the, the billions of dollars in government monies, uh, stimulus monies and other monies are being used. Uh, and so we think it's a, a really timely topic and we're just happy to be here. Uh, I am a, a partner in our the Manat Phelps and Phillips white collar and litigation practice. My main office is in New York um, and uh, I came to Manat out of a, a lengthy tenure in government service. I served as a federal prosecutor for over 20 years uh, in the Northern District of New York, an area that encompasses all of upstate New York, Albany and Syracuse, all the way up to the Canadian border and uh, notably encompassed a, a large army base, Fort Drum in Watertown, New York. And so uh, through the course of my work uh, as an assistant US attorney and during the Obama administration as the presidentially appointed United States attorney in that district, I saw lots and lots of uh, procurement fraud cases being brought as a result of contractors interacting with uh, uh, the Fort Drum uh, base. And uh, they had an aggressive fraud program there. Uh, our US attorney's office uh, frequently worked with the investigators at the various agencies, we're gonna talk about those, to develop cases, investigate them and prosecute them. And so we, you know, we've learned a lot um, from those experiences. We are now um, in private practice working on behalf of companies who come under scrutiny by the government. And I'm very happy to be joined by two really outstanding colleagues who have lots and lots of experience in this particular area. Serena Castillo, who's a partner in our uh, white collar unit as well, who works out of our Los Angeles office, 
and Andrew Zamiti, who is a very experienced uh, defense attorney who's, who's done much of this work, a Navy veteran himself, someone who's got deep, deep experience representing companies. He works in our Washington, D.C. office. So uh, it's great to have uh, our, our colleagues with us this afternoon. So if we get started, uh, we can talk a little bit about um, what the program's going to look like. And let me just see if I can get this teed up properly. Uh, looks like I'm having a little delay, but let's see if we can get the slides going. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Rick, what you want to do is just go ahead and scroll. Use your use your uh, scroller to scroll up and down. It should it should take you from slide to slide. I tend to use the keyboard left and right. What I find use uh, that works best uh, for the Zoom. All right. So, so let me let me try to uh, get to the next slide here so that we can talk about. And I for some reason we jump out of when I hit the keyboard the uh, slideshow format. Try this and then there. So if for me, when I just use a keyboard back and forth, it works. Uh, okay. Not so for you. All right. Well, that's that's the slide we want to be on. So let's talk about what today's dis discussion topics look like. We're going to be discussing the procurement process and um, how fraud enters into the procurement process at every stage along the way, from the earliest uh, inception point through the performance stage. And we're going to discuss um, how that can arise, what different fraud schemes look like, um, and, and how the government goes about uh, investigating them. The types of fraud, uh, pre-award fraud and collusion and post-award fraud, uh, investigating and prosecuting fraud. We're going to dive into the agencies that look into this conduct, how they do it, what statutes they use, what tools they have available to them, and what some of the consequences are uh, for companies that get caught up in these investigations and prosecutions. And then we're gonna uh, turn to a discussion of why compliance is so important. And I think this is really a critical conversation to have with companies who are contracting with the government. Uh, they need to know the importance of compliance programs um, what you can do to set one up, how uh, impactful they can be, and how they can help your business uh, operate efficiently, effectively, and you know without concern that you're going to be uh, facing a very costly and uh, problematic investigation. And then we're going to discuss some practical considerations, some of which have arisen as a result of the pandemic, and uh, and we'll end up with what happens if you do uh, find yourself on the wrong end of uh, an investigation. So um, if we can move on here, Let's see for some reason, yep, okay, looks like. If you click and re-engage, click on the screen and re-engage, the keyboard should work, but I'm also yeah, gonna do it for you. We may have to have you, I'm having a just slow remote issues. And again, yeah. it, for some reason, they things jump out. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. I may have you give us slide six, James, and we can talk a little bit about the procurement process and what it looks like. And there it is. So the procurement process is a multi-step process, uh, beginning with the identification of need uh, by an agency. Uh, they have some legitimate uh, uh, need or service that, that must be provided. And they will typically put out a, an RFP, some notification, and, and uh, that will begin the bid process. There are specifications established. And these specifications, sometimes we find, uh, can be tailored to particular contractors. And so there's a possibility of fraud entering into the the uh, procurement process at that stage. The solicitation and evaluation process. This is where uh, bids get put out and solicited. 
and uh, you know significant uh, irregularity can concern can can arise at this stage as well. And we're going to talk about the different kinds of fraud that we've seen um, during the solicitation and bidding process. And that might involve collusion between government contracting agencies or agents or personnel and particular contractors. It could be collusion between companies that are, are trying to um, uh, work together to corner the market. Um, so uh, that's an opportunity for fraud. The award phase itself can be a place where fraud enters in. Um, an agency might favor, for example, uh, one contractor over another, even though they made a higher bid, um, but they may uh, you know, try to justify that award to the higher bidder for reasons that are not legitimate. We've seen cases like that. And then of course, during the performance uh, process and uh, phase of the uh, agreements, monitoring and performing can sometimes be a segment of, of the contracting process where fraud can arise. And it may involve submitting fraudulent invoices. It may involve submitting fraudulent time slips or other types of irregularity, change orders. Uh, we've seen cases all along the spectrum here. And so we're gonna try and unwrap some of that for you. So James, I'll have you maybe work the next slide. The types of federal procurement fraud um, are very numerous. And as I mentioned during my term as US attorney in the Northern District of New York, we saw most of these schemes uh, put into play by unscrupulous contractors and others who were trying to game the system. And so um, as you see here, uh, we have uh, conflicts of interest. Oh, we're going to go back. Looks like we're having a little bit of technicality. Hi, Rick. I, I can just control the slides for the rest of the time, so you, you don't need to worry about that. Yep, I'm not touching it. We're going to leave it to you. We're going to talk oh. a little bit about the types of schemes oh. here. And so I'll let you, um, I'll let you handle the slides. Uh, Different types of schemes are listed uh, here in slide seven, and we've seen conflicts of interest and big, big rigging, collusion. Uh, they fall into different categories. Some occur at the outset of the procurement process, some occur during the award phase, and some occur uh, uh, during the performance phase of the contract. And so um, here's a list of them. Um, a lot of them are, you know, kind of make sense. I'm sure you've heard a lot of these terms. Uh, they, uh, I mean, can be complex or they can be kind of basic in my experience. And, um, you know, the, the key is that, that uh, through, some, through some manner or mean, they get, uh, authorities get alerted to these things going on and that can uh, trigger an investigation uh, and, and then, and then uh, it's off to the races in terms of uh, the company trying to deal with the allegations. Um, my partner, Andrew Zamiti, has done uh, a, a lot of work with these uh, different types of schemes, and he's, he's seen them not only arise in the context of a criminal investigation, but they can arise out of a civil dispute as well, Andrew. And, and uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, some of the the different types of schemes you've seen and, and how they've uh, kind of come about and come to light. Yes, thank you, Rick. Um, as you mentioned, I've, I've been quite involved on the civil side of this as well, um, where we've had litigation, uh, where we were representing a large uh, federal government subcontractor against a prime contractor on a major Air Force contract, for example. We experienced um, and discovered and reported on uh, all different types of fraud that was occurring in that case. Uh, many of the examples are listed here. Now we don't have them specifically broken down by phase, but what you were talking about in the earlier slide 
uh, is pertinent to this because the certain types of fraud are more prevalent in the pre-award phase than they are in the post-award phase. Um, and we're going to start getting into that. And so why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's talk about pre-award phase type fraud. And one of the more common types uh, that especially that folks on this call may, may have heard about, may be familiar with, read about, would be collusion between bidders. Uh, this is a pretty typical scheme where competitors ensure that a specific contractor wins the bid, often at an inflated price. Now, the winner may award the subcontract uh, uh, to, uh, of that bid uh, to a loser. There may be a pre an arrangement in advance or provide the, the competing bidder with a kickback for their services in return for that competitor uh, issuing a, a lower bid. Or it can simply be fairly innocuous seeming, although still illegal, where a group of competitors who are essentially colleagues or friends in the industry recognize that the pool of government work is fairly limited and agree in advance that they're going to divide up what work they uh, want to bid for. And so arrange in advance. You bid higher for this, I bid lower. That way you get it. And the next time we get a task order under this particular contract, we'll go the other way around. It's still illegal, even though a kickback necessarily isn't being provided directly. What are some of the, the red flags that investigators look for when trying to detect this type of fraud? Well, we have a few of them here on this slide. Limited competition in a particular procure procurement where there should be greater competition and you just don't see it. Uh, where you tend to see the same contractors bidding time after time on contracts, not necessarily unlawful in and of itself, of course, there, there, there could be a very limited pool of qualified contractors to perform specific tasks. And so you're naturally going to get a much smaller pool depending on the type of contract. But where you see this time after time where there should be more competition, it's a red flag and, a, and raises the suspicion of investigators that there could be some type of collusion among the bidders. Um, winning bid can be higher than expected. Um, you could have rotating bid winners, uh, a whole bunch of issues that arise here. And the one that I want to focus on here, only because this is one that uh, came up in a case that I was just referring to a little bit earlier, is where bids have similar fonts, colors, and mistakes. You would be surprised the number of bidders, um, especially those who may be a little bit less sophisticated, who decide they're going to copy, cut, and paste from one another's bid proposals, and those very same typographical errors and differences in font wind up appearing in one another's proposals when they get submitted. Well, that gets picked up by investigators pretty easily, and so it winds up being an obvious red flag. So uh, that's, that's something certainly that um, we would expect not just investigators, but prime contractors, if you're a sub, or uh, or any contracting officer to be able to detect. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So another type of pre-award collusion that we see, though not as frequently as collusion among bidders, would be where the contracting officer is directly involved in trying to fix the bid, if you will, or fix the procurement process. For whatever reason, the procurement, the uh, contracting officer may have a preference, uh, may have relationships, uh, maybe doing something that's uh, more overtly illegal, like um, accepting a kickback or a bribe. Uh, but this happens, and uh, I hate to say this, but again, one of the pieces of litigation that I handled last year, a uh, federal district court case here in the Eastern District of Virginia involved a large federal subcontractor and a prime on an Air Force contract where the contracting officer was clearly uh, working together with the prime and a group of employees who broke off of our client, who, which was the incumbent subcontractor to form a new business and compete for and obtain uh, a task order, several task orders under a very lucrative contract. We investigated that and found uh, that the, the basis for that was that there was a relationship um, that existed over a long period of time. They were former um, uh, former airmen together uh, in the Air Force. The contracting officer for uh, uh, the Air Force, the uh, prime contractors, uh, coordinating officer, and uh, uh, the employee who broke off and formed his own company from our client's business. They all knew one another from service on active duty. 
And uh, it wasn't necessarily well known to everyone who was working on that team that that was the case. But sometimes it can be that innocuous seeming, um, but it still is illegal nonetheless. And um, that matter was being investigated. It probably still is under investigation. And I don't know what the, account, the, uh, the outcome of the IG investigation is on that matter. Um, but it is an example, uh, a very overt example of that type of collusion. Um, you have different issues, different types of collusion where this is manifest, as you see on the slide. Need recognition. Uh, Rick was talking a bit earlier about uh, agency needs. An agency can go ahead and decide to order more than it needs for a specific product or service um, to benefit uh, the, the contractor in that case. Uh, you can have, and, and the contracting officers are directly involved in that process. They have to be. Uh, bid tailoring, uh, leaking bid information. That was a big issue that we had experienced where um, technical specifications were, were leaked in advance of an RFP to a competitor. And uh, we obtained evidence of that in the course of discovery and civil litigation. Uh, obviously unethical, obviously improper, and it's illegal. Uh, bid splitting, unjustified sole source awards, another uh, as well common type of uh, collusive fraud that you see where um, contracting officers cross the line and decide that only one particular contractor is capable uh, in the time period permitted of providing that particular product or service. And it may not necessarily be the case because there is a strong preference uh, towards competing these bids, not to, not to sell source awards, as many of you know. Moving to the next slide, some of the red flags that you see, um, and there are many, many of them. We've seen, I'd say, several of these red flags in the course of the litigations that we've handled. Um, but we, where you have a, a bid that somehow winds up um, being exactly what the government's ICE is, independent cost estimate. You have to scratch your head and wonder how that, that bidding contractor was able to get so precisely to that number. Well, that's a red flag suggesting that there may be some collusion. And in our case, it was a situation where the government contracting officer passed to the prime uh, coordinating officer for the procurement exactly what those uh, ICES were for that particular task order, and it wound up being put into the hands of their friend, one of the bidders who eventually was awarded that task order, a very substantial one, and that was part of the subject of our litigation. Uh, again, uh, very illegal uh, and the subject of an ongoing IG investigation. Um, other, other factors here that you look for, incomplete procurement files and backdating of documents. We saw evidence of that as well. Um, and awards to a bidder who is not providing the lowest bid, who is technically qualified to receive that contract. Um, that also happened in our case. You have, in our instance, a group of bidders uh, who broke off of our client, uh, formed their own business. They were brand new, had no performance history. Um, their technical qualifications were, were suspect, yet they were able to qualify themselves and somehow bid to the ice and, uh, and obtain the contract. So these, these are real life examples. Many of these red flags are tracked very closely by investigators and um, they are watching. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rick. So what do these cases look like? Uh, if we go to the next slide, we've got some examples of cases and you know these are ripped right from uh, the headlines uh, that have occurred within the last uh, weeks and months and sometimes within the last year. Uh, we have a case here of, uh, of fraud involving uh, SBA's business development program. Uh, and as you can see from this press release, uh, this is a matter that involved a construction company in Colorado that ended up paying $3.6 million to settle a civil case um, arising out of its use of the 8A program. And you know, many of you may be familiar with the 8A program, which um, uh, is administered through the SBA and, and uh, is there to assist socially and economically disadvantaged companies 
uh, with you know typically net worth uh, 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 at a certain level and uh, companies that have experienced racial, ethnic, or cultural bias uh, such that uh, the government feels it's appropriate to give them uh, a, a set aside. And so this company, VMJ Construction, was a company that took advantage of the 8A program. I, uh, doing a little research, uh, noted that 8A firms were awarded in 2019 about $30 billion in federal contracts. So it is a, a, a program that, that is quite impactful. Uh, and uh, it has some rules associated with it. And the rules are that the business owner uh, must uh, in fact be a, 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 someone who manages the day-to-day -day operations uh, of the uh, company. Uh, it's gotta be an independently uh, owned and operated company. Uh, the business owner has to disclose uh, his or her affiliation with other companies. Uh, it has to be responsible for long-term decision-making and uh, can't remain in the program indefinitely. It actually has a nine-year uh, window after which uh, the company graduates from the program and is no longer eligible. And what happened in the case of VMJ Construction is that they tried to game the system as alleged and made some false statements about their eligibility. They had you know, relatives who were involved initially um, uh, and, and uh, they, were, they were, it was alleged uh, making false statements about who was in fact uh, in charge of day-to-day -day operations, who was running the company. And uh, they had two, two relatives uh, who looked like they were kind of bouncing back and forth to meet the requirements uh, of the 8A program. Um, this is the kind of conduct that uh, can come to light and give rise to a government investigation. And we've seen lots of cases uh, like this, which um, I, I guess you might call Andrew, you know, fraud uh, on the front end of the procurement process, eligibility fraud. And it can involve women-owned businesses or, or uh, veteran-owned businesses or Indian-owned businesses. We've seen it come in kind of all shapes and sizes. Uh, but all it takes is someone to drop a dime on the company. It could be a disgruntled employee. It could be one of the red flags that Andrew described coming to light during the contracting process, causing someone to kind of look into what's going on. And, and then, uh, boom, the company is forced to deal with an enforcement action, which as we're going to hear can be civil or criminal in nature. And, and then uh, it becomes really costly. So in this case, as you can see, this, this case was settled uh, uh, as a civil matter, uh, which I guess is good news for VMJ construction that they didn't face criminal charges as a result of the allegations of false representations uh, uh, that were made about eligibility. And, and, uh, and they, they ended up paying and uh, resolving it. Um, so this is one example. We can move along. There are some other examples of fraud at different phases of the procurement process. And I think I'm gonna turn this over to Serena now to pick it up from there. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Yes, yeah, so as you can imagine, the post-award phase, because it, so it comprises such a significant amount of work, it's absolutely ripe for fraud. An example of fraud occurring after a contract award would be you know, a contractor submitting fictitious or inaccurate invoices for work. The work might not be performed at all, or a contractor may provide defective or substandard products or services in order to maximize their profit. And often the government employees may be involved and the fraud may involve false certification that the services were properly provided. So we've seen that post-award fraud can really take on many different forms. The, um, you can have fraud in the contractor accounting with false invoicing such as when a contractor submits an invoice for work that was never completed or phony time entries or ghost employees or even kickbacks to the insiders. We've seen that fraud may occur when the contractor improperly adjusts the material standards or substitutes a product, you know, providing non-compliant or substandard products and certifies that the substitute products 
actually satisfy the contract specifications when they most certainly do not. You may also see that there's fraud during performance where the contractors improperly receive, let's say, progress payments that are not tied to, that are not tied to the completion of any work. Yet another example would be repeated change orders that expand the scope to accommodate work not performed or to just increase the profits to the contractor. So obviously there are a variety of different ways so let's turn to some red flags and go to the next slide that may indicate a post-award fraud. So obviously there are just a lot of different red flags to look at that may indicate possible post-award fraud. This is just a non-exhaustive look at um, examples from cases that we've worked on. You can see duplicate payments, so a new invoice or for the same invoice getting paid twice for the same work or work not done at all. You can see invoices that just lack the supporting documentation, you know, frequent invoice errors or poor cost documentation, but you just continue to get paid on this. Missing or altered serial numbers, overcharging for materials, you know, restricted access to storage product facilities or records. Um, you can also see just continued acceptance of high cost or substandard goods. And again, as we've already discussed, you know, costly change orders without adequate explanation or progress payments. Those are all red flags that might indicate a possible post-award fraud. I wanna to turn to a real world example on the next slide of some post-award fraud that we've seen. So here, this is a recent case where a defense contractor and employees were indicted on fraud charges for substituting foreign made parts where domestic parts were required. So this would be made in the USA fraud. In this case, there was a Hamptons, Virginia based business sold the US government Chinese made goods that it falsely labeled as made in the USA. The company, which is iTech Incorporated, received about $25 million from the scheme as a supplier to the US Army, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard and other federal agencies. And in this case, it was a really wide variety of products. The company delivered clothing, wire, parachutes, and more that had been imported from China and systematically made to look otherwise. So how did they do this? Well, according to the prosecutors, between 2011 and 2018, so a pretty significant amount of time, the company coordinated with various Chinese manufacturers to produce goods under the US government contracts and actually shipped them here under a shell company. The company iTech allegedly then used a second company to remove any mentions of China on the items and replace them with made in the USA labels. And in fact, the company officials coordinated with the Chinese manufacturers to make tearaway labels. So that'd be easier for them to replace the labels that say Chinese made with made in the USA. And among other things, the company concealed the Chinese origin of Indiana National Guard t-shirts, swim trunks sent to West Point, Army parachutes, Marine Corps lanyards, and barbed concertina wire for the Defense Logistics Agency. And several times throughout the course of the scheme, ITEC falsely claimed to have a manufacturing facility in Virginia Beach, and later even provided falsified purchase orders. Finally, the company also used one employee's status as a military service disabled veteran to get certain set aside government contracts, you know, falsely claiming that that person was the president, even though he had no role in the company. So again, these kind of frauds, they can be really long, they can be a little bit complicated. This is, um, you know, the length of this fraud was pretty long and the steps that they took might be complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. They had someone make tearaway labels and they replaced the labels, making it look like the goods were made in the United States. So Rick, can I turn it over to you to discuss another recent example of some fraud that we've seen in the news and go to the next slide? Oh, Rick, you're on mute. Thank you, Serena. And you know that case is really an example of egregious 
conduct that, uh, as you noted, gave rise in that case to a criminal indictment. Uh, and so we see, you know, different types of responses by the government. Uh, really, I guess they boil down to three, uh, the worst being a criminal indictment being brought as a result of a criminal investigation, to maybe next less severe, a, a civil action brought uh, pursuant to different statutes the government has available to it. And the third may be being an administrative action. We're going to talk about what those look like as well. But this is an example on slide 15 of, uh, of a civil uh, action brought by the government. And, and again, you can see it's ripped right from yesterday's headlines here, uh, just in uh, last month in September. And an example where an Indiana-based asphalt uh, company was made to pay $4.25 million in a civil settlement uh, because it used um, an improper uh, balance of road mix, uh, the binder and glue balance used in its road mix, which was then uh, used to pave uh, federally funded roadways, turned out to, to be below um, specifications. And, you know, We've been involved in lots of cases with general contractors and subcontractors where there's been allegations of kind of improper mix of asphalt or you know substandard materials being used. But uh, when the when the material is being used to pave a, a, a pursuant to a federally funded uh, road program, the stakes are considerably higher. And so this kind of points up why federal contracting companies need to be really vigilant, really be mindful of their operations. And uh, this is just an example uh, of, uh, of some bad work, maybe sloppy work, maybe just uh, careless work, costing the company and its five shareholders lots of money. The five shareholders, uh, the case reports, uh, were made to pay uh, almost $2 million themselves out of that settlement amount. They had to provide sworn financial uh, affidavits and personal guarantees and letters of credit as a result of the settlement process. So uh, this becomes quite personal for a contracting company that gets caught up uh, in one of these investigations. And uh, I think, you know, points up how kind of a, what might be viewed as a basic civil dispute can be elevated to a, a federal uh, civil matter uh, because uh, of perhaps false representations made in the uh, in, in the process of certifying that certain goods were used and met certain specifications. So if we can move James to the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, who investigates and prosecutes pro procurement fraud. How does it come about? You know, this is a timely topic. We're not focused on it, but uh, with the CARES Act stimulus package, uh, which has been passed in several phases so far. The government has pushed out, uh, I think it's about $2.6 trillion in CARES Act fund. And that has given rise to, as it did back in 2008, in the wake of the uh, financial uh, meltdown at that time and financial crisis, uh, it has given rise to oversight agencies being created to look into where all this money is going and how it's being used. And you can see on slide 16 that, that there are several new CARES Act uh, agencies that have been stood up, the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee and the Special Inspector, Special Inspector General for Pandemic Recovery and uh, various uh, committees in Congress charged with oversight. Um, all of the money means lots of scrutiny. And I think it's fair to say that uh, federal contractors going forward are gonna face heightened scrutiny just because the government is, is gonna be looking to recover, uh, to recover funds any way they can that are associated with fraud and the public's gonna demand it as well. So um, we have these agencies that are specific to the types of funding that has been created, but we have kind of historical um, institutions that are charged with investigating and prosecuting fraud they're led, of course, by the 93 U.S. attorney's offices in the country, uh, and uh, I was uh, honored to serve as one of them. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, that the, pro the prosecutors in those offices are career people, and, uh, you know, they're very mission-oriented, 
and they're committed to trying to recover fraudulent, uh, fraudulently obtained funds. And so uh, they're active. They uh, take part in uh, in different fraud programs, hotlines. They they have a, a coordinator is assigned uh, in each office, whose job it is to meet with agencies regularly and uh, help develop investigations, ask questions, uh, read uh, reports that are generated by government financial service agencies, and really try to develop information uh, that, can, that can start uh, an investigation. Um, the Department of Justice, of course, through its main component in Washington, uh, it's known kind of euphemistically as main justice has a fraud section there with a whole cadre of prosecutors uh, who are kind of separate and apart from the field office, U.S. attorney's offices. And those prosecutors um, travel around the country to work cases up. Uh, and uh, sometimes the cases will be called to the attention of main justice or a congressional committee and be referred to main justice and sometimes uh, the field uh, enlists help from Maine Justice to work these cases. Um, and of course, we have the Government Accountability uh, Office, which has jurisdiction, as you can see, to investigate um, fraud, including CARES Act fraud, but other types of fraud as well, and utilizes hotlines, um, which can be quite a, uh, I happen to know from having worked in the government, a robust source of, uh, of case referrals. So, um, now, continuing on um, to the next slide, you'll see that there are different investigative agencies who work hand in hand with the prosecutors. And those agencies come from the various IG offices for the uh, different federal agencies. They all have them, Department of Defense, for, uh, for example, and all of the, all of the branches, um, all of the major uh, federal agencies have robust IG offices who have uh, investigative assets of their own and uh, use them frequently and use them in collaboration with other agencies. The, the military's uh, investigative, uh, criminal investigative organizations are another, um, I think, very kind of uh, healthy and active uh, form of uh, investigative uh, talent and, uh, and resource that the government brings to bear on these kinds of cases. And as I mentioned, out of Fort Drum, uh, the, uh, the Defense uh, Criminal Investigative Service there uh, had a couple of agents who were very active and enjoyed uh, working with uh, AUSAs to develop their cases. And they had a whole bunch to, to pick from, sadly. And so um, you'll see uh, some activity on that front as well. And then of course, the Defense Contract Audit Agency um, has audit capabilities and can make, make referrals and recommendations to agencies as well. So these are the just an example. It's not, an ex, it's not exhaustive or complete, but certainly this is a pretty uh, comprehensive list of how, uh, of all the different ways uh, cases can get investigated and means and resources that the government has to investigate these cases. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about some of the tools that the government uses, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Serena. All right, we're gonna start with um, the False Claims Act and or the FCA, because the FCA is one of the most significant tools um, to combat fraud and corruption by companies that are doing business with the federal government. It, it's really the primary weapon used by the federal government to redress fraud against government agencies and government programs. So the, the FCA provides civil liability against any person who knowingly submits a false claim to the government. This is very broad. And FCA actions can be brought directly by the government or very commonly by private individuals in key TAM actions where the whistleblowers, they sue as relators to hold the contractors responsible for their misconduct. The relators are actually incentivized to bring these actions because they can recover as much as 30% of any money awarded. And in fact, in 2019, 81% of new FCA cases were actually initiated by a whistleblower. And why is this? Well, because there's a really significant amount at stake. During the last 10 years, the government recovered nearly $38 billion under the FCA. 
In 2019 alone, the Department of Justice obtained more than $3 billion in recoveries. We've seen a bit of a slowdown this year just due to uh, the, the pandemic, um, but there's still been really significant um, recoveries at the beginning of this year and the government agencies continue to work. So we expect to see uh, FCA cases to, to pop up next year, um, at the end of this year, and they've continued throughout the year. We've actually seen a, a company actually go to trial. So the pandemic's not slowing the government down from recovering uh, monies that are owed. So um, in addition to the civil liability that I've already discussed, whenever someone knowingly submits a false claim to the government, criminal liability under 18 USC section 287 is also possible. So really there are you know, multiple areas of risk for government contractors to potentially run afoul of the FCA, including price and cost issues, performance requirements, or testing and quality control. I have a recent example where the DOJ announced a settlement for over $10.8 million to resolve FCA allegations. And it was that a contractor produced and sold substandard steel components for installation on US Navy vessels. The United States alleged first that the company employee knowingly falsified test results to conceal the fact that the components did not meet the Navy specifications. Second, that the company invoiced the shipbuilders for parts as if they were made to the demanding military specifications when they were not. And third, that caused the shipbuilders to invoice the Navy for the parts that did not meet the specifications. That's the false claim that they invoiced the Navy for the parts that did not meet the specifications. Um, and that's just you know a, simp uh, a single example that illustrates kind of the wide ac applicability of the FCA. What's important to know is that in addition to the federal FCA, multiple states have claims act statutes that are largely similar, similar to, but not always identical to the federal false claims act. I'd like to turn to the next slide and take a look at the California FCA or the CFCA. So the CFCA is modeled after the federal false claims act and has many of the same features you'll see that it permits the attorney general to bring a civil law enforcement action to recover, to recover travel damages and civil penalties against any person who knowingly makes or uses a false statement or a document to obtain money or property from the state or to avoid paying money to the state. There is the false claims unit of the state's corporate fraud section investigates alleged violations of the act and that can be based on referrals from the state, federal, local agencies, or again, whistleblowers. Um, the CFCA's key TAM provision permits a whistleblower to file an action to, to, to enforce the act. So again, much like the federal, here in California, the whistleblower lawsuits have resulted in some of the most significant recoveries under the act. The whistleblowers lawsuit in California and in the federal, uh, fired, filed under seal to permit investigations to, to decide if the government's going to intervene and assist in the prosecution of the action. And in California, like the federal, the whistleblower may be eligible to receive a share of any recovery. And the act also protects um, him or her against retaliation. So, you know, because the False Claims Act, either at the state or federal level, is really such a powerful tool for the government, there's a strong incentive for relators to bring these actions. So we always expect litigation to be brought using these laws by the government or by the private party. But the FCA is not the exclusive way. So let's quickly look at some other federal criminal statutes that government contractors need to be mindful of. And we can go to the next slide to do that. So as I mentioned, beyond the FCA, other um, avenues for prosecution include mail and wire fraud, conspiracy to defraud the United States, criminal false claims, major fraud against the United States, false statement and obstruction of justice, and the Procurement Integrity Act. So each of these are, are fairly flexible statutes that could cover a wide variety of criminal behavior. The mail and wire fraud statutes are frequently used to prosecute fraud. 
and companies may be charged with conspiracy to defraud the US or major fraud against the United States at the same time as False Claims Act violations, just depending on the circumstances. So in addition to these statutes, you also need to be mindful of administrative penalties that may follow a conviction. We can go to the next slide for those. So we have debarment and suspension. So debarment removes a contractor's eligibility for government contracts for a fixed period of time, while suspension temporarily debars a contractor for the duration of an agency investigation or litigation. The law of suspension and debarment, they have multiple sources and contractors can currently be debarred or suspended either under statutory provisions or under the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR. So administrative debarments can result when contractors are convicted of or found civilly liable for or found by an agency official to have committed certain offenses or when the other causes affect the contractor responsibility. Suspensions can similarly result when contractors are suspected of or indicted for certain offenses or when other causes sort of affect contractor responsibility. So, Rick, based on your experience as a U.S. attorney, do you want to comment a little bit about um, these penalties? Yeah, these are actually uh, what really get the company's attention because they can act in effect as a death sentence for a federal contractor. And so um, in the cases that I worked, uh, there was a lot of negotiating that went on about this uh, aspect of the case and about these the impacts of suspension and debarment and, and whether they were going to be part of a disposition. Interestingly, um, it's the agencies that make the call here. And as, as you pointed out, Serena, sometimes uh, the statutes require for mandatory debarment and sometimes there's discretion that can be involved. I, I think the federal acquisition uh, reg regulations um, allow for uh, uh, debarment, uh, even under broad circumstances when there hasn't been honest dealings. And a a Andrew might have mentioned that in one of his slides, and I don't have some experience with that. But um, I, I, this is certainly something, uh, you know, one major reason why you need to be careful about how your company is doing business, how you're operating. You need to really have eyes on kind of all aspects of your operations because you don't want to find yourself being faced with this kind of dramatic administrative remedy. So uh, I think that that's uh, certainly a good, good thing to point out, Serena, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that actually segues really nicely to our next uh, section. And Andrew, can you please kick off kind of the importance of compliance? Absolutely. Um, compliance is key. Um, and we, we're going to address that in the next several slides here. Um, but most uh, importantly, under the FARS, Federal Acquisition Regulations, Section 20310, federal government contractors are required to conduct themselves with the highest degree of integrity and honesty and have a written code of business ethics and conduct, an employee business ethics and compliance training program, and an internal control system. Now, these programs and systems should be suitable to the size of the company and to the extent of the company's involvement in government contracting should facilitate timely discovery and disclosure of improper conduct, and should ensure corrective measures are promptly instituted and carried out. Now, the compliance program requirement itself is implemented by FAR Section 52.203-15, which is also known as the 13 Clause, and that must be included in solicitations and contracts if the value of the contract is expected to exceed $5.5 million, and the performance period is 120 days or more. But that doesn't necessarily mean that smaller contracts or smaller contractors who typically deal with such contracts can avoid having to deal with compliance. It's just the opposite. Compliance is in the very fiber of the business that you're in. Um, and if you don't take, take respect of that, if you, if you don't have that integrated into your systems, policies, procedures, um, there's a good chance that even something that's simply negligent can wind up tripping you up and having investigators look at you for uh, something that's may appear a lot more serious or could be more serious, even, even if it was just uh, triggered by simple negligence. And I think going into the next slide, Rick can explain why it is for any contractor important 
uh, in the long run that compliance be top of the mind. And even if you're a small contractor, that you have some systems and some program in place to keep in mind that you have that you are following the FARs, that you are ethically uh, on the right. So, Rick, did you want to take that over? Andrew, that's so true. Uh, what you've said, and you know, the reasons are really ingrained in. Uh, in, in the principles that prosecutors use to determine how to deal with the conduct of a federal contractor in this case, or any business organization who is alleged to have engaged in wrongdoing. And as you can see here, we've pulled up a section of what's known as the justice manual, which is really the, the, uh, the kind of playbook for federal prosecutors. But back when I started, it actually came in about 12 different binders uh, it's now, of course, all online and easily accessible, even accessible to the public. And so the principles are all out there and well known to those of us who are engaged in this kind of work. But one of the key principles that uh, prosecutors look at when they're trying to make a determination about whether a case should be dealt with as a criminal matter, as a civil matter, whether it should be kicked to an agency for an administrative determination or proceeding is the adequacy and effectiveness of a corporation's compliance program. This, along with several other factors, I think are uh, you know, important to keep in mind. And you, know, you wouldn't have any reason to know about these if you're kind of going about your business, but uh, you should understand them. And some of those factors are sensible and kind of basic. Uh, the prosecutors will look at the nature and seriousness of the offense, uh, the pervasiveness of of the conduct, how deep is it? Uh, did it include uh, management? Uh, they'll look at the company's history of misconduct. Have they done it before? They'll look at the company's willingness to cooperate, its timely and voluntary disclosure, and what remedial steps it's taken. And, and uh, that will include um, implementing an effective compliance program and looking at what compliance program was in place at the time of the alleged offense. So, Really, really uh, important stuff, and we can't stress it enough. Um, uh, but and and you know, frankly, I get surprised sometimes when we come across cases where uh, this has not been uh, given any of, uh, or much thought uh, by uh, companies who find themselves at the wrong end of a of a state or federal investigation. Um, what are the fundamental questions that prosecutors ask about compliance programs? This has been the subject of recent guidance that's been put out by the Department of Justice. They ask essentially these three questions, whether the compliance program is well designed, whether it's being applied in good faith, and whether it works. And there's a lot of factors that go into how to, you know, the determination that is made uh, to answer these questions. Uh, but, it, you know, again, as a kind of a high level overview, I think it's important to keep these principles in mind. So if we can move along, uh, uh, this, this next slide, uh, I think Serena might want to talk a little bit about this. Um, and and Serena, we've seen kind of it in this difficult economic times, companies, you know, kind of pushing this to the back burner, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, it's really important that in times of economic hardship, you know, companies really resist the tendency to trim areas that are not directly contributing to the revenue generation, you know, such as compliance. Because really compliance means more than just the possibility to provide oversight for your business efficiency and profitability. You really have to have these systems in place to ensure compliance with all of the laws and the rules of the regulations and any new laws and rules and regulations that, my, that may apply to your company's activities. And I wanna stress that this really applies to all companies doing business with the government. The only differences that you're gonna see it, with a functioning compliance program would just be, you know, it might look different depending on the size of your company, but all companies, no matter what size, one person to a thousand people working for it, you need to have a functioning compliance program. So when, and especially when you have a smaller company, the tone that you set at the top is extremely important. And having a strong culture of compliance as a small business means that that culture is already there as your business grows. So 
really, you know, we've said this again, and I'll stress it one more time. It's especially important today, you know, corporate governance and compliance programs need to be established in order to affirmatively and systematically address any potential compliance risk and to satisfy newly imposed governmental requirements. There are you know, several components of an effective and efficient corporate compliance process that includes setting strategic directions for the enterprise, providing internal controls to mitigate risks, assuring that there are resources to implement strategic and operational plans, we need to heighten, it really heightens a company's attractiveness as an employer or as a potential acquisition target. And it impacts the company's overall reputation and brand to have a strong functioning compliance program. Um, you know, Rick has already mentioned that the DOJ's updated guidance um, really focuses on the functioning corporate compliance program. And the guidance also notes that even a well-designed compliance program might be unsuccessful in practice if the implementation is lax. So that means that the program needs to be properly resourced and also needs to be periodically reviewed to ensure that the policies and procedures are um, properly established and that the company is conducting a periodic risk assessment process. One of the things that is also coming out out of these um, times is that there are, it's possible that your organization might have taken some relief funds from the government, you know, including the CARES Act funds. And there are specific things that your company needs to keep in mind that you're compliant with as a recipient of any CARES Act fund. We've listed some here, but you need to remember that there are certain qualifications and restrictions. You need to make sure that all of your disclosures are really adequate. Um, and you need to ensure that you're properly using the CARES Act funds. In many of these cases, that's where record keeping becomes really critical. Um, so just the overall message for compliance is that, you know, the federal government, all federal, federal government contractors from big to small really need to keep in mind that there are, um, you need to be especially careful and really invest early on in the process to um, even prior to obtaining federal contracts. Serena, we've got a question that's come in on this topic and it is this, um, what steps can I take as a small business to create a compliance program. You mentioned at the outset that this is not a typically a revenue generating part of the company. You can understand and we hear this from clients. Hey, look at, you know, we're a small business. What can we do? Yeah, so let's talk about, actually that goes to the next slide um, because I have some practical tips and practical considerations. So one really easy thing that any business can do is make sure that their document management processes are in place. So um, you need to make sure that all employees and including yourself, if you happen to be the only employee of your small business as a government contractor are maintaining good practices when it comes to document management, that you're only using company approved channels to store your documents, to communicate, um, you're not mingling your personal email with your company email. You keep everything really, really straight and separate so that you know this is all of my company stuff. Um, and I keep all of my company things in, in this particular place. Um, one of the things that we've seen since we're all working from home, I'm working from home, Rick's working from home, we're all working from home right now. Um, one really important thing to remember is that no matter where the documents are created, you know, they all belong to the company if they're done during your work and employees are not, should not be storing copies of any, any electronic documents on home or personal computers or in personal cloud storage devices or accounts. Obviously, if you're a small business and you're setting up, you're running your business from home, Having processes in place to segregate your work things from your personal things, it's just the way to go. It'll make it so much easier for you in the long run to know that this is where I store all of my work documents and that my personal life is really separate from that. Um, we, we, say, we talk about this because we wanna make sure that the companies are really well positioned in case of a litigation, a government audits or any investigations. Um, so you know, companies really need to wrestle with making sure you have the correct work from home policies, bring your own device policies, 
and even ephemeral messaging policies. So those are messaging services that allow you to send a message that might disappear. Well, you know, just because the message disappears, that doesn't mean it's not part of, um, you know, some sort of litigation hold. And especially when you're dealing when you are a government contractor, you need to spend you need to spend a lot of time being very careful and setting up your processes um, before anything goes awry because you need to often you know collect all those messages and keep them all in one place. So again, really now more than ever, with so many people working remotely, it's important to emphasize that documents belong to the company and should be stored properly. So Serena, this, oh, yeah, go ahead. this kind of seems like a baseline message, right? I mean, if you're going to get into government contracting, it seems like you, you, you shouldn't do it unless you are assured you have at least these kind of basic functioning document management systems in place. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this is obviously a challenge for businesses of all size, and especially as people are looking um, to changes from work from home culture. But you know, even this is an important step that the smallest of businesses can take to properly manage your documents. Yep. So let's go to the next slide. Um, again, this is just reiterating that communications should be made only using company approved channels. And you know, even your voicemail on a personal phone could be covered by a document hold or retention policy. And again, this is really where ephemeral messaging policies comes into play as well. When you have already put a system in place that clearly delineates the proper channels for your work communication, it just eases the burdens if you need to collect documents or you need to know where to look. You know that I only used this sort of way to communicate about work. I collect all the emails from this channel and you know, it, it makes things a lot easier for you. Um, for your employees, it's also really critical to ensure that your employees are adhering to the procedures for storing official copies of documents and any communications when they're working from home. So, you know, Rick and Andrew, I wanna bring you into this conversation and see if you can speak about any general steps a company needs to take um, or keep in mind if they learn of potential fraud. I think that would be relevant for us to go to the next slide because we uh, anticipate just that. Um, when an investigator comes knocking. Um, one of the first things that you need to do uh, is not to, uh, and I know it's many people's natural urge to want to be truthful and open your book and say, okay, I have nothing to hide, let's talk. But you wanna consult with outside legal counsel as early as possible if you are uh, made aware of the fact that you're the subject of an investigation. It's very important to have the counsel's expertise to determine you know, the degree to which there could be danger or not, the degree to which you should cooperate or not, the, the degree to which there should be some form of voluntary self-disclosure or not. And soon after, I think the counsel will advise that it's very important that you conduct an internal investigation to determine the size, the scope of the problem, the severity of the issues involved, so that you can make those kind of decisions um, smartly before you jump into uh, interacting with investigators. Um, and as, we, as I mentioned, where a violation is believed to have occurred, um, there may be other issues that you need to consider, whether uh, voluntary self-reporting itself is, um, is preferable, um, whether investigators know about it or not. Are you going to come clean? Are you going to cooperate and put yourself in a position where it becomes important for you to mitigate potential penalties. Andrew, um, that, if I can interrupt, that seems counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, you know, this idea of self-reporting when they uncover something wrong. Why would a company ever contemplate doing that? Well, self-reporting, depending on the context, can earn you credit, if you will. Uh, depending on the agency, some agencies can offer um, some significant mitigation in the form of reducing a penalty, whether it's a civil monetary penalty, uh, potentially even a criminal penalty. Rick, and you can speak to that from the DOJ perspective, I'm sure. Again, you know, this, this idea of uh, what are the factors that prosecutors and investigators consider when they're trying to decide what to do with a case. And there's, you know, very much uh, disc uh, discretion involved in those kinds of decisions. And so, 
you know, like in all matters of life, you want to be on the right side of those discretionary calls and you want to do whatever you can to influence them favorably. And so, you know, one of these ideas, perhaps, uh, I think the fundamental idea is to have a strong compliance program to start with so you can avoid them. But when you have them, you have some hard calls to make in terms of how deep is the, is the problem? How serious is it? And you need, you know, experience to help with that. Uh, you need counsel who's been involved in those, making those kinds of decisions before. And I know uh, that's something that uh, me and my colleagues uh, have done a good bit. And uh, I know it can create some stress on the part of companies, but um, I think that uh, hopefully if you're mindful of some of the things we've talked about, if you're kind of aware of the schemes that occur and the tools that the government has and some of the factors that they use to consider what to do about uh, potential fraud that might erupt or that you might be caught up in unknowingly uh, through the unscrupulous activity of of some uh, uh, company or person with whom your people come into contact. That happens frequently as well. So um, some tough calls here, um, but, but uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, with uh, adherence to some of the principles that we've discussed, um, you can navigate your way through them and, and be a, a profitable, energetic uh, and robust federal contractor. So, um, Andrew, anything else on, on that? Uh, you've, you've had cases that you've had to do battle with sometimes, I know. Certainly have, um, and I'd love to be able to talk about those. But before we run out of time, I think we want to give uh, folks who are listening in an opportunity to ask some questions and have us answer them. Right. So if you have some questions, uh, you can certainly uh, use the Q&A box, and we'll turn it back over to James here for a minute. I will just give folks um, a couple minutes here, maybe less than a couple minutes to enter their questions in, and I'll just go over some of the other events that we have coming up. Um, so, for instance, for, the, for this event, we partnered with Manat, who offered the content. Um, we are partnering with A New America for a, uh, for a webinar on Tuesday, October 27th, Intro to Government Contracting for Women-Owned Businesses. So if you are a, uh, a woman who owns a business and you're interested in government contracting, this would seem like a logical first step. Um, then on the 29th, we have an intro to SBIR, STTR funding. Um, and this is with Tech Futures Group and the SBDC. Um, so if, you're, if your company is involved in innovative technology or innovation in any way, and um, you're looking to get government funding, this is the one area where PTAC can actually help with funding. Um, and, and, and grants, because the SBIR is kind of a particular kind of grant that's halfway, half government contract, half grant. Um, so tune in for that. That's on the 29th and on, on October 29th. Then we have government contracting in bid protests. This is going to be a back to basics well, once again with Manat. So we're excited for that as well. And that will be on November 18th. All right, looks like all of them are at 10 a.m. So go ahead and go to our website. You can sign up for all of them. They're totally free, just like this one. And let's see if we have any questions. So um, you can see our information there. Uh, if any of you, uh, you, you know, want to ask questions offline or you have issues or situations that you want to, some assistance with unpacking, we're happy to consult with you and talk to you. And, and uh, we're very approachable. So just give us a call, shoot us an email. We're happy to give you a few minutes of our time to kind of help you size up the situations that you face. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten is this, and I'm gonna throw it out to both Serena and, and Andrew who've had to deal with this. How do investigations begin and how long do they take? So uh, Serena, I know you're coming off a very big one that's taken a while and, and so let me, throw that to you to start and then we'll have Andrew comment on some of the experiences he's seen. Yeah, so the how, how long do they take question is it varies really widely. It really depends on the kind of investigation about the parties involved. Um, so, you know, some, some investigations can be completed within a year if the um, question is narrow if the if the information is relatively easy to gather up 
Um, and that can be, you know, you can package it up to the, it, it, especially if you're self-reporting, you can do your an internal investigation, package it up to the government, let them know and kind of resolve the situation. Go ahead and, and pay any fines that might be owed, repay any money that you might have received wrongly. That can be wrapped up pretty quickly. Um, other investigations, um, you know, Rick, you mentioned, and I don't want to scare anyone, but this was a very complex cross-border multinational investigation that I worked on for over a decade. So, you know, that's not the norm. Um, you know, I would assume that a lot of the cases that would come up for any of the members of the audience would be things that you could wrap up a, lo a lot easier than that. And Andrew, you can comment on that, but also comment on, um, you, you know, we mentioned this concept of a document hold, kind of, you know, maybe, maybe not everybody knows what that is. And, and, you know, how does an investigation begin and what impact does it have most immediately on a company? So a question about how an investigation begins, it can begin any number of ways, Rick. Um, you can have a report submitted by a whistleblower uh, through a hotline complaint. You can have um, uh, an audit uh, resulting in an investigation where there's a referral made by the auditing authority like DCAA. You can have the contracting authority itself detecting something uh, that it then reports to um, its enforcement agency. Um, and if, as you mentioned, Rick, uh, the various U.S. attorneys' offices uh, in coordination with Maine Justice are always on the hunt through initiatives of theirs and looking for fraud, just as they are now uh, in oversight with other agencies um, administering the CARES Act funds. So there are, there are many ways that that can get started. The one, the one probably most important that gets overlooked and more common, as in my experience, are what your competitors are looking at. Because... If the competitors are out there and feel that um, they've submitted the technically qualified lowest bid and they're not winning, um, they're going to be looking for reasons why and to try to get that overturned either through the bid protest process, uh, if they sense procedures weren't followed or if they feel that there was something improper, uh, something fraudulent going on, they'll report it. Um, and it's possible that could be done through a hotline complaint or directly to investigators. Uh, the consequences to the business, of course, can be quite severe, uh, not just in terms of the fact that you'll be under the microscope, but that you'll be spending time and money defending yourself in these investigations. And the key is to get that legal counsel up front so that you can determine, again, the severity and scope of the issues and adjust properly to determine how you're going to get this behind you as quickly and effectively as possible. Great, great. Serena, any further comment on that? Yeah, and um, you know, as I mentioned about the internal investigations, you don't always have to wait for the government to come knocking if you suspect that there's some sort of fraud that may have occurred in your company. If you suspect that there's something that has not been completely kosher in, within your company, you can do an internal investigation and you can often, often self-report. As we mentioned, self-reporting can wrap things up quicker. It can lead to good graces in the government and can oftentimes really reduce the penalty because there are you know, a myriad of things that can go wrong with federal contracting and you can find a accidentally find yourself committing fraud. And if that happens, the thing that you wanna do is really get out in front of it. Um, don't wait for the government to come to you and just think, well, you know, maybe I, maybe I didn't need to get that million dollars, but maybe no one's going to look at it. They right. will eventually look at it. And I think the point I would add is that, you know, you, you want to get these things wrapped up quickly because these investigations are disruptive. And yes. just the mere fact of collecting documents can be costly and expensive and timely and time consuming. It can really uh, crush your IT department or your IT administrator. So these are things that uh, you wanna get resolved quickly. So if, if you come upon them, as Serena said, before anybody else does, certainly uh, get some help and uh, find out the best way to quickly kind of uh, it, administer uh, to triage the problem. We have a one question. More, that, oh, sorry, uh, one more comment on that is uh, the idea of whistleblowers. You can use whistleblowers to your advantage. So if you have an internal whistleblower hotline where um, employees can sort of report issues up the chain, then you can do the investigation yourself. So a whistleblower 
isn't always a bad thing. It's someone who can identify an issue for you within the company and allow you some time to take care of it, presuming that you have all these compliance systems in place beforehand. That's a great, great point. We have a question that came in. Um, can we work with an agent or agency on compliance procedures and policies to help us stay in good standing with them? Um, uh, do you, either of you have experience uh, with the agencies kind of helping out in that regard? Uh, helping out, not, um, I, I can't really speak to that, but I know that they really heavily scrutinize or, or look at the compliance policies that a company might have during the course of an investigation. So having those policies in place are an app. It's, it's such a fundamental necessity to make sure that you have to ensure that you can come out of the other end of any investigation kind of um, the best way possible. So I, my experience with this question uh, uh, is uh, with a contractor having a good relationship with its contracting authorities, with the with the government uh, contracting personnel. And of course, sometimes that can lead to, as Andrew pointed out, too cozy a relationship, and that can be a problem. But I think good communication with your contracting partners on the agency level um, can allow you to, you know, kind of take their temperature a little bit to maybe to, you know, test some ideas that you have to make them aware of some of the policies and procedures you have to maybe offline ask for some suggestions of things they've seen. I think that kind of back and forth is really good and, you know, might lead to further work with an agency. And, uh, but certainly I don't think the, the, the government contracting authorities are going to be in the, they're not going to be handing you a, a policy and procedure document. And so if you need help with that, certainly that's something that firms like ours um, are, are happy to take a look at and kind of walk you through. Uh, another question we have is what if an agency is covering up fraud uh, and you know you don't know where to go? That can be, I think, a more challenging problem uh, because if you suspect that there's fraud on behalf of an agency, then you're probably really gonna have to um, develop facts with the assistance of uh, 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 lawyers who know kind of how to navigate the terrain. And you know you you should have good evidence. You shouldn't be making uh, allegations that that aren't supported. And uh, any any uh, uh, lawyers, when we're contacted about those types of questions, we say, look, we're happy to dive into these for you because I mean, let's face it, it happens periodically. It's sad to think, but um, certainly um, you should be vigilant as a federal contractor to fraud occurring uh, by government agencies, and that can give rise to corruption investigations. And that was one of the categories of, of uh, procurement fraud that we described. And there, you know, the cases are replete with examples of uh, corruption matters that have arisen in the procurement process. And Rick, uh, most the agencies will have their own independent inspection arm, will they not like an IG's office that also can serve as a place? Ab that you can absolutely. Go. Yep. And that's a, that, that's probably the place that we'd begin, but you want to do so in a, in a responsible and careful and factually supported manner. So I think that's a great point. Well, look at we're uh, we're bumping up against our, uh, our time frame now. I see it's two 30 and, uh, uh, I just want to say that it's it's been a real pleasure to be here uh, with the NorCal PTAC and James and his colleagues, and uh, we're, we look forward to working with you again in the future to answering questions that you have. Our contact information is here uh, on the screen, and you'll have these materials for you uh, so, so that you can refer to them if need be. So until then, on behalf of my colleagues, Serena and Andrew, I'll turn it back over to James, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was uh, a really excellent presentation, well organized and very informative. Um, so we're looking forward to the next webinar uh, um, November. Um, so we are bringing things to a close here. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, just want to let you know one more time, everyone will be receiving these slides in PDF form. They're going to go on our website. We've also been video recording. So that's going to go on YouTube and linked to our website. So you'll have the whole suite um, to review what we've been over today. Um, one more point is that we uh, have a little exit survey, satisfaction survey that just lets us know how you felt we did today. It's important to our funder and it's important to us so we can keep improving our services. 
So once again, thanks to Manat. Thanks all of you guys. That was really great. And of course, for the participants, um, you're why we do this. So thanks for coming and see you next time. Have a good afternoon.